Hi again to the Cuban listeners. Today I have the pleasure to share with you a podcast with Dr. Sandra Black, a professor at the Sunnybrook Research Institute. Dr. Sandra Black has been doing research for many, many decades, and that is exactly what we explore in this podcast. We started the conversation with an overview of Dr. Black's career, the advancements in the field, the importance of protecting your cardiovascular system, and we ended with fun facts about her, such as her passion and talent for piano. Along the way, we talked about what it meant and what it means to be a woman in research, the changes in research because of the pandemic, and also we talked about the care we provide to patients and other important part- topics for the future of bioimaging research. A little reminder that if you enjoyed this format and want to discuss science through this podcast, do not hesitate to contact me. My email is in the description. I hope you enjoy this and I hope to meet you again for the next podcast. So hi, Dr. Black. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, So to start, would you like to talk to us a little bit about your career in research and what inspired you to make that decision? Well, thank you for the opportunity um, to self-reflect and to look back at my career. Um, And I have to say, it, it wasn't so much deciding to do research. I was interested in the brain and understanding the brain. And I started off my career once I finished um, medical school or partway through medical school. And I went to, I had the privilege of going to Oxford as a Commonwealth scholar to study um, uh, the understanding of brain behavior relationships as they developed in the 19th century. And so I was able to follow um, the development of ideas, first of all, cell theory, and then eventually brain stimulation techniques that began to say, this part of the brain makes you move. This part of the brain makes you speak. Um, Broca and Wernicke, they were uh, the the observers who discovered the part of the brain that allows you to speak and the part of the brain that allows you to understand words. So I was, I was very interested really in brain behavior relationships from a very early age in my career, stage of my career. And I, um, uh, I did a equivalent of a master's and started off doing a, uh, <clears throat> pursuing it as a doctoral thesis. Because I was interested in um, a guy called Sherrington and Pavlov, where they were after the unit of behavior in the brain. And Sherrington, it was basically, you know, reflex action, reflex for your sensory neuron, and it makes a motor neuron do something. Um, Whereas in, uh, in Pavlov, it was a bit more than that because you could condition those reflexes by, you know, developing pathways through sort of habit forming. So I was very interested in that. Um, unfortunately, partway through, my father um, became ill. And so I came back uh, before I finished. And I was partway through this special blended program of undergrad and medical school. And I came back and finished medical school at the University of Toronto. Um, when I did that, I knew I was interested in the brain. So I went into neurology, fascinated by, again, you know how the brain works and the various diseases of the brain. And then I did a postdoctoral fellowship. I guess that was, you know, the beginning of my sort of research career in London, Ontario, believe it or not, because there was, um, you know, a really forward thinking um, neurologist. His name is Andrew Curtez, um, who was a behavioral neurologist back in the 1980s. Um, so I spent um, a couple of years with him, again, being very interested in the brain. At, at that time, we only had CT scanning, right? Mm-hmm. But St. Joe's Hospital, where he was at, had the very first MRI machine in Canada. They beat out Princess Margaret, you know, at University of Toronto, because there's a little rivalry there. And so we were doing MRI scans on people with acute stroke before we could even get a CT scan, because the CT scan was at another place. And it was amazing because it was 0.15 Tesla, Whereas now the standard is 1.5 Tesla, which means a much weaker magnetic field. And it was like doing something called a diffusion scan, where you can see changes in the water of the brain, et cetera, in a way that was very informative because people would have a negative CT scan and then they would have had their MRI scan and they had a massive stroke and you couldn't see it in the first days of a CT. So that was like very fascinating. And I got very interested in people with language loss and 
um, something called neglect, where if you have a right hemisphere stroke, you can't really perceive the left side of space, um, and uh, apraxia, where you carry out actions. And so those are discrete uh, processes that relate to different kinds of injury in the brain. Language and praxis is mostly left hemisphere, and neglect and visual spatial is right hemisphere. And that's how I got started. And so my first grant when I came back um, to Sunnybrook and started in 1985 was actually to um, do some work on letter by on on, on reading um, when you have a, an occipital region that's affected. And that was because I I came when I was doing my my postdoc. It was around the time that what's called information processing approaches to neuropsychology was starting to take hold, where people were looking at different steps along the way to try to understand, you know, what happens when you try to say a word, what are the processes that are involved. And in the case of a certain kind of injury to the brain at the back, you can no longer read words as a whole. You have to spell them out. It's called letter by letter reading because mm -hmm. you lose the ability to do parallel processing, which is what happens as you're learning to read as a child. You become able to read a word that's eight letters as quickly as three letters because you're parallel processing, and that has to be taught. That is not natural. That is something that you have to be taught. So that was like my first grant with my colleague, Dan Bob, who is uh, very interested in this. And then pretty soon I started doing a stroke series, looking at cognition and you know outcomes. And that's how I kind of got going. And I have to say at the time, it wasn't any forgiveness for being a woman mm -hmm. and having a child and that sort of thing. Um, and I had my my only son, uh, 1985, when I sort of, in the year I came back. I even timed it so that there would be some time off before I started my position, because, you know, it was really frowned on in a way, you know, to, you know, to be... To have a career, yeah, I see, I see. Well, and especially um, Sunnybrook is sort of a military hospital, right? It's a veterans hospital. And it was sort of, hmm, my goodness. So, um, <laughs> and then it turned out that, you know, even if you make allowances for that, you can't be as productive, right? If you're also child rearing. And it sort of became obvious for the like, like career awards that you couldn't really compete. And yes. they didn't even have any mat leave, right? And so it wasn't until 10 years later, I remember you know, being on some of the review committees for the Heart and Stroke Foundation, I realized this is really hard for women, right? Yeah. And 10 years later, they start to allow women to have you know mat leave in the programs, in the you know, neurology training programs, et cetera. There was no allowance, you know, for, you're still ready, you know, we work 36 hour days sometimes, right? And we had the first stroke unit in, in Canada and at Sunnybrook. And that's how I got very interested in stroke to continue to be interested in stroke. Um, and so really I, I kind of stumbled into it because I loved to learn and I loved to understand brain behavior relationships. And then what happened, I was, <clears throat> Very lucky because right around the time that I was launching further into my career, which was the early 90s, um, a group in Harvard came out with a protocol for how to look at the brain, which included a three-dimensional acquisition uh, with an MRI scan, even 0.1, uh, 1, 1. 1.5, and some other measures. I won't get into the technicality, technicalities, but it allowed you to see the spinal fluid around the brain and you could sort of do proper removal of that spinal fluid to get to the edge of the brain, which other techniques didn't do. And I had a medical biophysics person who kind of took pity on me and allowed, allowed us to implement this protocol. And I, and I had a neuroradiologist that allowed us to do this protocol. And that led me to launch something called the Sunnybrook Dementia Study, 1995, which is still ongoing mm -hmm. with a foundation grant from CIHR, funded continuously by the CIHR. And what it was is really what I call research embedded in care. So as I was caring for patients, if they agreed, we would do some extra study. We would give them the MRI scan that was like, I mean, it was eventually became three Tesla, but it was really like a higher field, but it was just as good as three Tesla, just the resolution is a bit better. And um, this physicist lent me a programmer. So we started to try to do some programming to see more what was happening in the brain, there's something called white matter changes, there's the, the gray matter and the, and the white matter, and then there's some changes in the white matter that we saw called white matter hyperintensities. 
And that's where we got launched. And it was really just seeing what was there in real people. Not only that, we could follow people to their brain donation because we had a very supportive neuropath department. Mm -hmm. And we started to find out, you know, surprises. There were new diseases that hadn't been described or old diseases that were very rare, but we could see what the brain looked like, what their life was like um, in terms of the problems. I had a neuropsychologist, Dr. Donald Stuff, Stuss, sorry, S-T-U-S-S, who was a thought leader, you know, in brain, well, in frontal lobe function. And he helped us with Baycrest, our partners in Baycrest, to develop a very comprehensive neuropsychological battery that we followed over time and we had behavioral measures and all the rest of it. Eventually, we started to collect blood because we discovered um, some genetic factors that contribute to Alzheimer's disease. So we worked with somebody called Peterson George Hislop, who at that time, he had discovered one of the autosomal dominant genes for Alzheimer's disease, which means you get sick in your 20s and 30s, mm -hmm. and you're dead in your 40s and 50s, right? So so we were sending bloods and collecting bloods partway through. We didn't know to collect blood for like proteinopathies, like the protein um, signals that Alzheimer's disease was happening, because that only developed in the last few years. Yeah, it became popular very recently. That's right. I have a quick question for you, which I, I really like to ask researchers because some researchers will only do research and others will do like you, like research and patient care. Do you feel like your your patient care side really has informed what patients need? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know and some, uh, some participants often of other studies, not the one that we're doing because we also offer care, but uh, some participants will often say that they feel like the the research team is quite distant or their needs is not listened no. to much no, it's actually we enhanced care okay. and people um and we we always informed them and included them almost as co-participants right because yeah. you know they had a consent and we had an ethics removal and all and, and so on but even following people to post-mortem and then we would find out when we were right and when we were wrong and when there was a surprise and we would give families a feeling of closure when they agreed to do that. And that is because I think the the important thing is it's very multidisciplinary, but the mm -hmm. main theme for me was really the brain imaging. Mm -hmm. And partway through, um, we were able to uh, hire our own neuroinfatics person. We worked together closely with Baycrest in, in some of this. Um, and that's when we started our sort of what I call personalized pipeline, because most of the like something called free surfer where they, they can quickly give you your cortical thickness. Um, as very, um, it doesn't, it doesn't really take into care of the, in, into account the surface of the brain. It just like, it just assumes they're doing it right using the brain itself, the T1. Yeah. But often it over and under erodes part of the brain. And so when we saw that, we thought we can't use this because it could leave out the anterior part of the temporal lobe because your sinuses are under that and it doesn't see it in a, in a magnetic field, right? So we, ours always allowed you to see the surrounding spinal fluid so you could get a proper surface. And we would trace the strokes, trace the white matter, and we would mask it out so we could get the same answer. But it took more, more time. It wasn't as, it was semi-automatic. And then we started to, you know, have the, the informatics um, input and so very dedicated, bright you know, students and fellows uh, who made this now a very, a, a very popular pipeline. If you have anything other than just, you know, kind of Alzheimer's disease without any white matter disease or any strokes or anything like that. So, and we also discovered perfect. perivascular spaces. These are little spaces in the brain, which is the channels all along which your, your amyloid and other garbage gets pumped out of the brain every night, right? So we showed that those were important when people have sleep apnea and sort of have post stroke problems. With apnea, so this 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 was very much embedded in care, and we returned all the information always to the patients, so they felt part of it, they were informed by it, and we were you know we were even given um, a sort of a you know kind of a special privilege because we said to our neuroimaging folks, you know sometimes you have to wait a long time when we're doing neuropsych testing and behavioral testing and other things. Is there any way that we could take you know a scatter of maybe say six scans that would be done over like four or five months could we consolidate those into one day mm -hmm. and they said yes and so we have what we call dementia sunday once a month and we get to have six spots 
So that allowed us to have the neuropsych and the other thing in, in conjunction with it. It was still, these are still legitimate scans. But I'm just trying to illustrate, you really have to have a lot of cooperation. It's very multidisciplinary, right? I mean, research, it's a, research is a teamwork thing, right? Like, a, absolutely. No, no one woke up and just no. had the idea from A to Z all on their own. I mean, maybe, but that would be very, very... You can't know all the different aspects of it, right? It's way too complex. Of course. And I mean, we before we started this podcast, we were talking about the pandemic. And I think that the pandemic, in a way, kind of made us lose a little bit this big picture, right? Now we're all in our like little corners. Now we're starting to go to conferences again and like meeting people. And you see the learning curve for students and even PIs to start talking with people again and to kind of do too. Yeah. And when you run up after a talk and you say, what about this? What about that? Or you chat over coffee. It's so important. So important. Or, or even when you present your own work and people say, oh, I think this is wrong. Or I think you should do this. All those ideas, you can collect them and then do something so much greater. Well, in fact, you know, giving a talk by Zoom. <laughs> you know, it's, it's actually, it's a, so I was going to say a silver lining, just like you were saying, a silver lining, because people don't have to come in every day, maybe. Is yeah. also that you you can there are webinars all kinds of things that you would never be able to see maybe uh, in person that now are available all these different options but honestly work. honestly when I'm giving a talk by Zoom I'm I'm talking to cyberspace I've got no audience I can't read them we can you know people can answer questions but it's very anemic you know you feel like you haven't got enough blood flow there right, or something or or your iron deficient or something and so it, it makes it possible to do talks but at the same time it's not as satisfying as you're there people run up you get to read the audience you get their questions and that i think i i really miss and i think that's what really has changed forever that there's going to be always this there's going to be a hybrid aspect to this i mean people are starting to do the meetings in person but still um having people come in to their you know to their workstations it's hard to it's going to be hard to enforce yeah it is a, a slow process but hopefully slowly people are going to get motivated again and now that i'm talking about motivation this question that i wanted to ask is something i am very very curious about yeah. um what kind of mentor yeah so you know what i'm going to say because that, that was a very interesting question yes and frankly in in a certain sense i didn't have any mentors what I did have was colleagues. I, what I had were colleagues mm -hmm. who um, allowed me um, to express my vision and what I wanted to do and enabled it. Yeah, they were they were colleagues who like the, the person who lent me a programmer um, who allowed us to implement this this special um, imaging protocol. Um, Doctor and that was like a medical biophysicist, Doctor Bronskill. Let me a programmer, right, to start doing this. Dr. Stuss um, helped us, you know, shape a neuropsychological battery that's very, still very appropriate. And so it was more that I had enablers who were colleagues, yeah, or only mentors. There, there were very few women, yeah, doing what I was doing, right, and very few who were having children. <laughs> to tell you the truth, because when you do have children, it's still it still affects your career path. Would you, you, still have to take, you still have to take time off, right? Would you say today that it has changed a little bit or you think we still it's, have a lot of work to it's, do? It's better. It's better. Yeah. But there's still a cost because yeah. there are there are more husband and wife, you know, taking turns, doing things, and men can have paternity leave. And so it's more balanced. But there's still often a little blank in your career path, right? And if you're competing with people who are, you know don't have that option or can't have that option or don't take that option, they can still accomplish more in the same period of time. Yeah. So, that, so there is a there is a downside to having a family and sort of having a family life. Um, and so that I think is still hard to in a very competitive world. It's still hard to know. You know, if you just have to kind of realize that having a family life and having children is an amazing experience, right? So you. You do it, but you sort of risk your career path in some ways, but you enrich your life in all kinds of other ways, right? Yeah, I can see. I can see what you mean. And I feel like nowadays, of course, we have like come a long way and you have a lot of uh, 
universities and research programs saying that they accommodate women all the time. <laughs> and then when you look at the reality, it's maybe a little bit different. Yeah. But uh, I do feel incredibly lucky that uh, I've had, actually, I've only had female role models. <laughs> now yeah. that I think well, about now there are, now there are. But yeah. also just been, I remember, I don't want to get too specific, but there was somebody who well, she had three children in fairly quick order. Yeah, it did have an impact on her career path. She's, you know, brilliant, excellent scientist. But her productivity, she came from another lab and then had to start from scratch and didn't have a lot of other people sort of supporting what she was doing. So there was a little kind of gap there. And she wasn't going to get her um, promotion. And um, so there was a meeting about this because uh, she's very productive. She's been a huge contributor. And um, there was a meeting about it, and I was trying to advocate and say, you know, you've got to make allowances for people who are, you know, has three children. Yeah. And you know, the only reason that we, uh, this is this is sort of an interesting point, the only reason that we succeeded was because on the committee there was a, uh, a representative of the university who happened to be Orthodox Jewish, and he believed that it was important to people have, to have a right to have children. And so he was sympathetic, and she squeezed through. Okay. And she turned out to be enormously important in some of the most groundbreaking work that we do at Sunnybrook, which is this focused ultrasound, where you, um, you know, you can open up the broad brain barrier and deliver, you know, kind of molecules that might be beneficial, or you can, an essential tremor, you can lesion the brain very gently with heating up the brain, and it's now an approved treatment for people with essential tremor where their hand shakes. So uh, this person turned out to be hugely important, but she she risked she, she was she was at risk, and that's, well, you uh, can't compete the same way. You just yeah. can't. But what you are mentioning, I think, is very valuable. And recently, I had this conversation with Dr. Greinberg from UCSF, yep. where he was saying that this responsibility of accommodating people comes from the PI, but also your peers. You know, supporting people coming back to work, understanding that when you have let's say one, three children, you cannot like reply as much as you cannot do as much, or you can do it differently, but to still be there to support, which brings me to the next question, which is what mentor would you say that you are? What kind of mentor? Yeah, I, that's a very interesting question. I've been thinking about it a lot. I mean, I think it's I a hard thinking, question for sure. No, I would say I think I'm a lucky mentor yeah. because okay. <laughs> if, you are, are, if you are blessed to have very talented people, then I had lots of ideas. They had to kind of, I give them opportunities and then they just take off. Mm -hmm. The other thing that, you know, I'm, a dead, I'm at a disadvantage com compared to most of my junior investigators. I mean, my, the, my, my protégés, let's put it that way, because they all have PhDs. They did the MD PhD program in Toronto where they did PhDs in other ways. Um, and they're, they're kind of way more savvy in terms of some of the, you know, statistical analysis and that sort of thing. I mean, we have we have a, statist a statistician that helps with analysis. But I um, I really, I, I afford them opportunities to pursue lines of research that they're interested in, and then they just kind of take off. And I've been very blessed to have really brilliant. I mean, some don't work out so much, but really brilliant. Uh, many are now um, leaders in, you know, as cognitive or stroke neurologists, because originally I was doing a lot of stroke work. Mm -hmm. across the country right um and others are still in toronto at sunnybrook i have um they, they've stayed at sunnybrook and they've become leaders in their own right and i just get such joy out of seeing that and they're now mentoring others so it's not really a style a style is to try to find something that sparks an interest in someone mm -hmm. and allow it to flourish and then you have to kind of rein them in to make sure they actually get papers written and things done right <laughs> I mean, that's the main, uh, the supervisor, like when you're a student, I feel like you think you can do absolutely everything at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> so it's always nice to have a supervisor to kind of guide you and redirect you a little more and focus you a little bit. Well, and one thing that was very interesting is that Sunny, uh, sorry, University of Toronto developed something called the Institute for Medical Sciences. Yeah. And that was a new concept. It was sort of in the late 80s, early 90s. And it really was to attract individuals who were going to do medicine either to do um, it as they were going through medicine or get into medicine and then do it. Um, and so it was actually, they realized that clinician scientists were going to be a dying breed 
because um, you're distracted when you're having to do your, you know, medical training, right? Yeah. So sometimes if people take time off, sometimes they do it beforehand, but they're in this program called the MD PhD program. And I benefited from that tremendously. In fact, I ended up getting a mentorship award, the first award they ever gave from this Institute of Medical Sciences because I was taking advantage of this opportunity. And I had some very bright young, you know, people doing masters and mostly PhDs, but then going on to be major contributors on their own in their own right. And I think that's because they realized that clinician scientists are an at-risk breed because you have to juggle so much. You have to succeed, you know, in the clinical realm of care. And you have to contribute in a, you know, aware in, in, in the realm of actually very often in clinical trials. They often design clinical trials, they run clinical trials, but they can also do observational studies that are very important. And then I've also been blessed with um, people who have PhD backgrounds in neuropsychology, more recently also in art- artificial intelligence. And I kind of co supervise some of those individuals or in neuropsychology would co supervise. And so I would be co mentoring with somebody with expertise in imaging or expertise in neuropsychology, for example, or even in genetics. So I would say it was, it was kind of luck in a way, but I have lots of ideas. Um, I kind of, I can generate ideas. The thing is then try to make them, you know, kind of turn into a project. When they I, still, I still collaborate a lot. I'm co-supervising, you know, with people who do, who, who are biochemistry smart. And, you know, I, I never, you know, my last year of university, I was very active in student politics and we were reforming, you know, some of the honors programs at U of T. I thought they were too narrow. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons I went to Oxford was I was star for some some humanities because we were doing labs all day long. And, it was, and um, I didn't I didn't study enough my biochemistry. Right? So I passed it. But it was my weakest. It was my weakest mark. Um, I was lucky, you know, to get the Commonwealth Scholarship and so on, but I've always been a little weak on biochemistry. And so I work very closely with, you know, pharmacology, toxicology, and people who are expert in that. And they have enriched, you know, my research life so much, and I've helped them to also kind of achieve and, and get grants. So I think it's, a, again, it's almost like a team sport. Yeah. With the mentorship, um, and it's a kind of a mutual relationship, and you have, you feel very invested. It's almost like having a family, actually. <laughs> Yeah, it's like a parent almost, right? But then I mean, you learn from your children. You learn from your children too, right? Yes. Yeah, some people say that it's a your supervisor is like a lifelong relationship that you develop. It doesn't just end when you're done with right. the, your grad degree. Oh my God! You've got to do a letters of reference. You've got. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I mean, I I I have over 100 letters of reference a year. I have to do. Working on it. I mean that itself. Is a you know and they've got deadlines and I mean it's. Uh, I'm very know. curious to know. <clears throat> don't know if you know the exact number, but do you know more or less how many? Yes. You do you know? Yes, we counted. How many? I <laughs> almost a hundred. My God, <laughs> that is a lot. Now some of that might be, you know, letter like two or three letters on one person to different applications. So sometimes yeah. there's that, or it might be. You've already done one a year before, and now there's an update. But also for my, now we have like graduate students. I have a, and I, and I were, the other thing that I, I'm, <clears throat> if you go to the website called Brain Lab, <clears throat> which is not our full website, um, but it shows some of the past people were very, very EDI mm-hmm. and welcome, uh, you know, kind of, we didn't, what, what the person's preferences were, what their background was. Didn't matter. We we wanted people who were interested and who could work um, together with others and you know contribute ideas. And one of one of my um, staff uh, was quite remarkable as an undergraduate. He had spina bifida mm-hmm. and um, was involved in the hydrocephalus society. So he's black, and I, I don't know if he's Nigerian or what he is, but he was very brilliant guy. Eventually, um, he he worked with us. He's published, you know first author papers with us and other papers from his undergrad. And then he went to York and did a master's in psychology, which is finishing. And then he got a scholarship to go to Edinburgh to continue his, you know, his PhD, to do a PhD. So doing a letter for him, you know, for different applications, I could repurpose. But what a joy. This guy is amazing. Just amazing, right? It just gives me, it just thrills me to see how well he's doing. And it just... It elicits such admiration, right? Because he had to overcome a lot. Mm-hmm. 
And you can just tell there's a little limp he has. Not, it wasn't severely affected, but, you know, um, so that, that inspires me. And also I get inspired by the patients that I get to know, especially some of the stroke patients who had remarkable recoveries, despite huge, you know, kind of parts of their brain being injured. Yeah. I guess being part of that is probably motivated to get up in the morning, you know, like contributing to people's life in a positive way. Like it's That's right. I, I enjoy the patient encounters. I love counseling them. I love it to understand things. We show them their scans. We teach the fellows how to look at scans. So, because it's not just a report, it's a sort of living person there that you can help them understand, right? Um, so that I, I, I love, I love the patient interaction. Um, I love seeing students, you know, kind of do well every once in a while. You know, the pandemic has had a bit of a, it's been hard on the graduate students. The fellows are more mature, but the graduate students have struggled, right? Because they haven't that, that next to next, you know, you don't go have a coffee with somebody, you don't see your ups and downs in the same way. And so that's been an issue. But the, the question about how to advise young scientists, I mean, it seems a bit, you know, kind of trite, but you really have to have a passion. You really have to have something that interests you, right? And then you pursue it as best you can. And you also try to work together with other people so that you can build a team, so you can build, so you can make up for your deficiencies by other expertise and yet inspire people to, you know, to work together. So that's, that would be, you know, it's kind of a trite thing to say. You have to build on not just your abilities, but also what things um, you're curious about, what things you really want to find out, and then just go for it. And I've, you know, I've really had some very successful um, MD, PhDs who are like way smarter than me and they're way more competent and they're doing really well. And I just love it. I just love it. Let's take a little pause together to understand what we learned, but also to check out the Cuban blog website where we write different articles and we have other podcast episodes about very cool science stuff. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and also on Instagram where we promote different articles and different events coming. And also don't forget to share and like the content you see there. That is all I had to say for our little ad time. And now we can go back to the podcast episode. You mentioned like so that that would be kind of the advice you would give to people. Another question I have for you, which I think is so important and not talked about enough, is how do you approach failure in science? And what is your plan of action after you failed something? Or fail could just mean like maybe you didn't. No, you gotta you gotta have some failures to uh, to yeah. sort of toughen your toughen your soul and, and tough it. And so you've got to accept that when things don't work out and not be destroyed by it. And yeah. then to figure out, well, what went wrong? What should I have done better? Um, and I was kind of, an example of this is, there was something, something, there was something you asked, but that people don't know about me. Um, I was very interested, never as a career, but I, I loved music and I loved, I started playing piano at like age four. And okay. my, my brother um, was a very accomplished pianist by the he, he you know he to the royal conservatory of music um and he actually you know performed the greek concerto at, at some point but um i loved i loved music uh and i didn't love practicing right? so i went through the ranks and i got to the uh, the the time to do the associate of for the royal college of uh, music in toronto because it was i was in sault ste marie a little, a little town up north right And yet I had a great music teacher, but I wasn't so great at practicing as I was in high school and I had lots of other things going on. And so I in I kind of incorrectly thought I could get away with this thing called it's the solo performer. You have to actually play pieces and you know, do something in front of a person as well as you have to write a whole bunch of exams. I don't even know how I did it, you know, in harmony and so on. And I went, I hadn't practiced enough and I failed. And I thought, I deserve to fail mm -hmm. and I'm going to really work on this this year because I want to get it just a, a, in principle. And so I did, I practiced and I was able to get the solo performer ARCT, also associate for the Royal College of Music in Toronto. Um, and actually when I went to the University of Toronto, um, one of the first things they had me do, I was at Victoria College, is they invited me to give a concert and I actually did a concert. But the problem with piano is you got to keep it up. Yeah, you can't, you know, you have to practice. So if people, you know, have a, if they like music, 
have something portable, guitar or something like that, right? Not something that you have to have, a, a, you know, a piano and, and, and practice. Yes. <laughs> but that was an important mistake, which made me realize you can't get away without making the effort. You have to work at things properly. And then when we have grants that don't work out, you look at the reviews or or papers where they have, um, you know, kind of they they reject it. Then you try to learn what did you did you not communicate correctly or whatever. Um, and so I think you learn. I mean, the tougher it, it toughens you up so that you're ready for life. Yeah. You know, you can't just kind of breeze through life with no failures or you're completely unprepared, you know, for the real world, right? I do think that failing or just being uncomfortable, like the moments in my life where I've been uncomfortable is where I've learned and grown the most. So I really think that not to, if life was on easy mode, then I feel like nobody would learn. You would be very stagnant and boring. (laughs) Well, also, and you can't get something for nothing, right? I mean, you really, that's that's like the wrong message. I mean, some people do with their privilege of lucky but this was oh sandra why did you even you should not have taken that exam because you weren't ready right yeah and that was a really important lesson but i think it you know then there's other things where other people judge you and you fail because you don't meet their standard and then you fight back and you have to you know you have to kind of still believe in what you're doing and one of the things i also say to families you know who are struggling with especially in young age with alzheimer's disease or other conditions is you can't make it so we'll talk about progress in a moment because we're in a magic moment i think in alzheimer's disease treatment potentially um not magic but we're in a kind of transformational moment um but it is that you you want to look back as the spouse the family the person to say i did my personal best i did the best i could with what was happening to me right and i try to give that as a message which is don't be too hard on yourself don't give up just Try to keep, you know, doing what you're doing. And you need a team. You need, you know, you need support. I mean, it's very hard if you're all all by yourself, right? But you want to look back and maybe your family, your kids would say, they did it with dignity. They did it. They did the best they could. Yeah. And that's why, you know, with their behavioral manifestations, we try as best we can now to control those so people are not acting out and not sort of, and, and, and that can be a very, very demanding period in people's lives. So we, again, we try to support the families. We try now we've got better medications and mixes of medications to help when people are, you know, kind of violent or kind of disruptive. But the whole goal is do the best you can and don't be too hard on yourselves as family when it gets pretty frustrating. Yeah. And I guess that's just, I, I, I think I'm sort of a, a naturally very empathetic kind of person. Like I get a little emotional even just talking about that personal best thing because I feel so much with how people are feeling. And I think they appreciate that. But there's still you need pragmatic, you know, successes. And right now we're in a transformational moment because we can measure blood tests. I yeah. can tell you you have the disease pretty much. Um, and we have some disease modifying therapies that are trying to remove amyloid. They may not be the whole answer, but they may be making a difference. And so just like in stroke, I was I had the privilege in stroke of seeing the arrival of TPA, the um, clot busting agent. Mm-hmm. And I was the only person doing it at our site for the longest time. And I managed to find one of the other neurologists willing to take call, you know, one in four or something like that. And I did three out of four calls, right? So when you talk about work-life balance during the <laughs> 1920s, that was pretty tough. And my husband, now they think about it, you know, he'd come home at, you know, three in the morning or something like that. Um, that was asking a lot. And I ended up having one child who's... Uh, wonderful he's now a lawyer with two little grandkids Mm -hmm. but work-life balance was hard to do you know back in those days yeah and um i think now there's a lot more i mean imagine no mat leave (laughs) so i I was able to time just to be lucky i was able to time a six-month period between when i finished my fellowship and when i started in july and so even you know even like breastfeeding you know (laughs) I would be I would be doing that in my office, uh, you know, expressing so I could take it home yeah. and happen to be uh, somewhere where we could put it in the fridge. But it was tough. It was tough. Would you say that your perspective, that your perspective on the work life balance has changed throughout life? Um, no, I mean, I think I, I, I'm so passionate about what I do. I have to make sure to balance it better. And I you know lately with the pandemic and everything, it's been very hard to balance it right because all everything got sort of topsy-turvy 
Uh, and also even being afraid to, you know, be with each other and all that stuff, right? So in different households, it's it's been very hard. And also having a, a wonderful mother-in-law who died shortly after the pandemic, and only ten people were allowed at a at a burial site. You had you could have no funeral, you have nothing. Yeah. And I remember uh, being at that graveside where she was buried with her husband, just feeling how awful this was. Because there was no ability to celebrate afterwards. Everybody was afraid to even be together. Even outside, people were wearing masks. So yeah, very it's, sorry it's, about this. It's, 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 it's been very hard. You know, it was a very difficult time. And I think people are recovering slowly from that. And coming out stronger for some people and for others, it's a bit more difficult. But um, you managed being passionate when I ask you about your work-life balance, which obviously helps when you have to work a lot, is there one thing you can pinpoint that really excites you about research nowadays? Oh, I mean, I think it's, I think that we have the prospect, just like with stroke, that we could reverse something or we could slow something down. And so I'm feeling more excited than ever that we may actually be able to slow down Alzheimer's disease, yeah. even though it's only part of the story and a lot of people have mixed disease. And partly because of what I learned which is that the vasculature, the blood the blood vessels to the brain are very much a part of what mm -hmm. happens in Alzheimer's disease. It actually, it's a disease of the blood vessels as well as of the brain. And I think that I saw because in the 1990s, we kept seeing this white stuff. It's called white matter disease. Yeah. And we followed people. And actually one of our brand contributions is we discovered what the neuropathological basis of that is. And that is hardening of the deep veins, draining blood from the cortex toward the venous sinuses. And we published a neuropath paper. We published you know, imaging analysis on it. But it's very hard to sell that to the world because they still think it's all myelin, demyelination, right? Yeah. But it's actually a venous disease. It's a venous insufficiency disease. And I've had a heck of a time trying to sell that to other, you know, kind of uh, investigators. We finally had a replication study mm -hmm. done by some colleagues in Oregon where they had brain imaging before death and they followed people, you know, to their death and then were able to look at what predicted the severity of the white matter disease, it's called hyperintensities. And they, they found the same thing, which is scarring of the veins. But it's very hard to sell that. And that's very interesting. We are, we're sitting on a paper, I think, that people have to see that there's co-localization of the periventricular white matter. The ventricles in the brain are cavities that make the spinal fluid. And around them, there are veins that are draining in toward the ventricle, toward the sinuses at the base of the brain. And they come in from the cortex in. Um, and that, the periventricular part of the brain, deep in the brain, is underperfused compared to the cortex. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a ghetto. I see. It doesn't get its fair share. And over time, what the veins do, because their job is to drain, um, they harden their walls. So they can still drain, but they lose all their flexibility to manage like fluid, too little, too much, and sort of be more adaptive. Um, and they start to leak, and that leaking can also hurt the cells that make the myelin. So it's been interesting to see how, like this is over 10 years ago that we started to show this and talk about this. and. Now, I actually published, you know, pathology on it. We found this one lab that replicated it, but people still don't realize that. Like, see, they, they don't, they don't understand the neuropathology. So we're having to, you know, what you have to learn is you, sometimes you have to advocate yeah. for your own self if you're too ahead of the game or you're not, you're questioning the kind of going, reigning views of things, right? You're mentioning here the flexibility of the veins, and I know that nowadays in Alzheimer's disease, lifestyle factors are very so important. Popular. So very can important. you talk to us a little bit about protective factors to protect our veins from our... Protect your, well, you have to protect your arteries, too, and that's why... I diet, so first of all, lifestyle choices are very important, but you have to have your cholesterol treated, you have to have your diabetes treated, you have to have hypertension treated, and by the way, we thought 140... Uh, as a systolic blood pressure was the aim was the kind of the the uh, level that you would have to then start to start to treat people right a couple of years ago they did major studies and they thought oh my god we have been under treating it it should be 120 120 that's okay. 20 millimeters more injury that's going on to the vessels 
that we allow it to happen, right? Yeah. And it's only because we've got better blood pressure medications and cholesterol, all these that we can do this. So having your blood pressure normal is really important. And that means also cholesterol, diabetes, and blood pressure are extremely important to control. Then there are the lifestyle choices. Yeah. Physical exercise, very important for the brain. 7,000 steps a day, preferably. People who have dogs often do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's why dogs are good for you, not just because they're man's best friend, but also because they make you walk. Yeah. Um, Mediterranean diet, just recently out of the UK Biobank, Mm -hmm. showing that out of you know which is like five hundred thousand people and they had a sample of sixty thousand and people followed that diet which is fruits and vegetables um kind of poultry sand you know kind of fish not so much not so much red meat um and extra virgin olive oil right you could just dump it on your food that seemed to have a protective effect in yeah. longer term um sleep is very important restorative sleep of course sleep That's apnea sleep okay. apnea is very bad for you and that's because when you're apneic, you not only do you cause low oxygen, but you, you get alarm bells ringing because yeah. you can't breathe and you get an adrenaline surge. It keeps waking you up. And it also sets your, your thermostat for blood pressure higher. So it's a risk factor of high blood pressure for, for stroke, for dementia and for heart attack. Got to be recognized, got to be treated in, in midlife, especially because a lot of people think it's fine to. To just snore. It's if you're apneic. That's really important. Yeah. Third is um, a physical activity, Mediterranean diet, sleep, and then finally social engagement. Yeah. You know, thinking about others and doing things for others is also beneficial for the brain, or even at sports, just doing something you enjoy. Music is underutilized. Music is music to the brain is actually very stimulating if you like it. Not you know, <laughs> it's not hard rock. If you're you know, not the other thing is like I'm a great jazz fan and. I just love jazz, and sometimes when I just want to calm down, I'll play some, you know, some Os Oscar Peterson in particular. So I think um, I think the lifestyle choices are extremely important. Yeah, and, as, and, and in fact, in, from your forties on, I mean, for your whole life, but especially in midlife on, the best effect comes from midlife, forties and fifties. Yeah. I think we could also add probably smoking to this list. Oh, that's that's yeah. so bad. I won't even talk about it. I mean, <laughs> It's no, a smoking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, smoking. No smoking. No smoking. So we, the other thing is alcohol use now is a big issue. Yes. Not just because it affects on the brain, but because it's a cancer risk. Yeah. The new guidelines are just shocking, which are like two drinks a week for men and women. And everybody's like, what? <laughs> Yeah, people it? take way more than that most of the time. <laughs> that's because of cancer risk. I see. Which was brand new. And it came out of these big, you know, Hundreds of thousands of people, you're looking at these risks over time. And, and that's why, we, you know, some of these big epidemiological studies are really informing us about how we should manage. Now we've got, like, pollution. Yeah. That's not good for you either. And, you know, we, we have climate change and we have lots of other things going on. But I think um, I can't emphasize enough that we do every single time we see people the importance of lifestyle choices and management of vascular risk factors and matter management of risk factors are much better now because we have better drugs mm -hmm. and there was a, um, a study that was done by my colleague dr shinsky where they looked 10 years after we introduced the stroke um, system in ontario where we not just put in place paramedics and people getting to you know the hospitals in time but also a stroke prevention a clinic system across the province and they looked at the age-specific incidence of stroke 10 years after compared to 10 years before that program came in in 20, 2003. I was very involved in that, for example, because that was a big step forward. And the age-specific incidence of stroke had gone up 33% just in 10 years, probably because of the prevention. Mm -hmm. And the age-specific incidence of dementia, which takes longer to kind of see the effects, was about, it had gone up by 8%. So that mean, that meant that people were older before they had their first stroke and older before they became demented. So there's some data right there that's suggesting these public health measures um, and, and, you know, medical care system measures really do make a difference. But there's a lot of individual choices that people have to make to make sure that they are living a a healthy life as they possibly can. To be, to be quite sincere, I thought that because of the rise of obesity, I thought we were unhealthier. So I'm quite surprised of what you're telling me that uh, we're actually having strokes later. I thought it was the opposite, the other way around. 
Well, you know, I think there are some, uh, the obesity is a problem in Canada too, of course. And, yeah. you know, there's a lot of interest in the Novo Nordisk semaglutide, which by the way, is also being investigated. We're part of the clinical trial in Alzheimer's disease because it may have a beneficial effect on the neuroinflammation aspect of Alzheimer's disease. So um, yes, no, you're right. And obesity is a major problem that makes you at greater risk. But, um, you know, and obesity is an actually a contributing factor to later life, you know, yeah. kind of problems. But usually people don't live long enough to get dementia, frankly. <laughs> I see, I see. So to be avoided. Yeah. So I, I think weight control is also, I, I, that's sort of taken for granted that you should be eating heart healthy and, you know, not overdoing the calories and not, not all the bad calories that just give you fat. It's actually abdominal fat. Yeah. That is the, is the bad actor in this because uh, abdominal fat, the visceral fat makes cytokines, which are inflammatory substances that can injure the blood vessels. So it's all, you, you can have, you can have fat in your thighs and your bum, and it doesn't seem to be as uh, much of a problem. But mm -hmm. what's around the viscera in the in the in the gut? That's what matters. Well, I hope this gives people uh, something to think about because I know some people, especially when we're young, we really think we're invincible. So it's really nice to think about these and to make sure we're doing like uh, the right choices. So one another question I would have for you, because we're coming to the end, would be, and I love this question. It's probably my favorite. What would you say to a younger version of yourself? Um, I mean, there are some things I might have done differently. I don't know. I, mean, <laughs> I, think I was kind of, well, no, I was kind of lucky. I, I mostly got to do what I wanted to do, right? And yeah. often with, with support, like I went on a Commonwealth scholarship to to um, England. That's where I met my husband. Um, and I've mostly been able, I feel kind of blessed in a way, I've mostly been able to do what I wanted to do. I think uh, it's gotten complicated, uh, the life force, life force balance. Mm -hmm. Maybe that could have been different, although it's just hard to know how you could you know, actually do your job and, 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 and do that. So I have some you know, regrets there a little bit, although Happily, my son is doing well, and I've got two delightful little grandsons. But it's just hard to, it really is hard to juggle it all, right? Of course. Uh, and that I, you know, that may be, um, and it continues to be a challenge even now, especially with the pandemic. And, you know, I, I, I think we're, it's, it's been hard on me just because of interacting with people is what sort of gives me my daily feeling of satisfaction, right? Mm -hmm. And to have that all shut down and all doing it, you know, kind of with virtual was, it, it was actually, it was hard on me. I got, I felt a, I felt a, a grief. I still feel a grief mm -hmm. that I can't totally shake. I and I knew, I knew when it was happening, I, I, I felt sort of anxious about the future in a, in a way that I think is, it's playing out. And now there are way more things going on besides just, the pandemic you know like climate change in europe and you know god help you but um i'm not sure i would change too much i mean i think i i was i was lucky to be able to do what i wanted to do at various stages of my life and and that's lucky i mean i also had you know the other thing i should say is my mother and father were sort of models for me my father was an obstetrician and gynecologist who um you know was a he was not just technically great but he he had to, and he had a wonderful manner. The, the, the women all loved him. He was good looking, and he uh, he was an excellent obstetrician. But he ran into he ran into problems because he wasn't fully qualified at a time before they had qualifications. So he had some issues, um, and he eventually um, he died of gastric cancer at fifty nine. That's what brought me back from Oxford because you know there was some major things to deal with. Mm -hmm. But he exemplified you know a real dedication to his his work and uh, the patients um, enjoyed him because he was so caring and competent. And then my mother was a community activist I and mean, she was like full of beans. She was a nurse. She started the Victorian order of nurses. She started, you know, kind of social, uh, you know, social system supports for people. Um, she supported education she brought arts to Sault Ste. Marie, the festival of arts and so on. She was just a dynamo, right? Um, and she lived to 97. Um, but in the 1980s, she was actually awarded, uh, an Order of Canada. 
recognizing some of her, you know, tremendous contributions. So um, I, I come from a family of, you know, very dedicated, caring people. And I think that's been followed by my, my brother, professor of neurosurgery, you now retired at Harvard. My sister uh, was a geneticist. Um, and she's also, you know, uh, interested in genetics and you know, uh, in vitro fertilization, that sort of thing. She's still in practice. And then I, my fourth uh, sibling sister is has a great voice, and she and her husband are choral directors in the educational system in the, in the states. All three siblings are in the states. It's, they all found sort of opportunities there. It really seems like you've been exposed to both science and uh, humanities, like social yeah. sciences, which I feel like you know sometimes when we talk with certain people, it seems like they only see numbers and forget the people. So it's really nice to to be able to understand people's needs and to be to listen to them because it's one thing to understand them another one to listen so my last question for you is would you like to share something that most people don't know about you or anything else you would like to add uh, well no i guess it is that um i you know I, i wish i i wish i had been able to i loved i loved playing the piano and it was something yeah. i demanded to do when i was like four years old right so <clears throat> um and and so I and and the fact that I did actually take that through to the you know to be able to do a concert uh, is meaningful to me but I was never able to pursue it because mm -hmm. you just have to keep up your technique yeah. um but the fact that I, I I love I love piano music I love jazz piano um that's why Oscar is a favorite person um and um and maybe not to me you know that's not something you talk about much because it's more to do with my past life but it's also what I listen to when I want to calm down or I want to feel uplifted, right? I tend to listen. I, I love classical music as well, but I, um, I especially love certain kinds of jazz. Hey, music is extremely powerful. It can make your day wonderful. It can destroy it as well. So it really depends. Uh, I really think... But, you know, we recommend it to families, also for people. With, there are some individuals who are interested in looking at music and dementia. Yeah. And how it might intervene. It might, it might, it might help to make people feel better we even say if the there's a partner and they, they're not too physically disabled put on some music and dance <laughs> dance you know like with parkinson's you can dance better than you can walk oh that's, that's so because <laughs> because when you're listening to music and you're you have parkinson's you're using a different uh, a different system it's not the voluntary it's an involuntary system and so they have dancing with parkinson's and that all fell apart during the pandemic but hopefully it'll come back And that's something I think that people don't appreciate. And I think the Alzheimer's Society now is trying to give these MP kind of um, uh, recordings so you can, people can choose their own favorite things, mm -hmm. even in like homes for the, you know, kind of nursing homes and retirement homes. So people can have access to that music that makes them feel, feel better. I do see like uh, this new wave of really mixing art and care, like art therapy can be through drawing, music can be through dancing and so many things. And there are a lot of benefits. And I know this side of, uh, of care has been like underutilized in the past, but I really think I'm positive that now people are using it more and more in therapy. And you know, there was actually in Toronto, there's a real, a real sort of um, victim of the pandemic was a, a, a program called the Bitov Center. In, in Toronto, where they had even very advanced people who would come in and they would use all kinds of different me mediums. It could be finger paints, it could be um, a kind of um, sculpture, it could be all sorts of things. People with like very advanced stages, right? But they had this kind of personalized, they came with their care partner and they had these kind of very personalized projects. And people loved it. It was actually wonderful. They loved going there. And it all fell apart with the pandemic. They tried to, op they tried to do it virtually but it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. And that program's lost forever. And it was a wonderful program that we need to replicate all over the place. Mm -hmm. The other the other sort of um, important point I make just before I leave is the Aphasia Institute, I better get going, mm -hmm. um, is, a, is, is it's centered in Toronto, but it's about supportive conversation for people who lose the ability to speak, especially from a stroke, um, or have progressive aphasia from Alzheimer's disease. And it's called supported conversation. And they have now evolved into having all kinds of pictographs and materials to help families, as well as speech pathologists and other people learn how to find out what is on somebody's mind. They know more than they can say kind of thing, right? 
Yeah. That's an amazing program that I was fortunately able to be involved with early on in the 1980s. And then the director of that program did a PhD with me on supported conversation. And she actually did a clinical trial to show how much difference it made. And she's a really, you know, brilliant speech pathologist and a thought leader internationally. And um, I've just been, she's another example where I've been blessed by somebody who's like really amazing and has actually changed people's lives in a, in a way that's extraordinary. So um, these are opportunities when they come along that you, and I continue to sit on their, on their research ethics committee now since 1985. I go to all the meetings, but now they're, now they're virtual meetings. Yeah, I do see that now, like science is still, you know, it's, it's very competitive, but there's still a lot of people that can make a change. And there's really, like, if you want to get into science, don't hesitate and do it. You know, there's a lot of things to do. <laughs> well, she showed that it worked, right? So it, it, it made them eventually, but they had a hell of a time surviving. Eventually, the government started to give them some money. Yeah. And so now it's, get, it's got a bit more security. It makes a huge difference to people's lives, honestly. So those kinds of things are just opportunities that come along and you grab them because you think somebody really can you know, kind of accomplish something. And I've, so I think I get a lot of my pleasure through the success of the individuals I've had the pleasure to mentor and work with. And that sort of also keeps me going. And then I also just love the patient doctor interaction. But am I an I just an extrovert or introvert? I'm a bit of both, actually, which is interesting. Summer, winter, I'm definitely rock and classical. Coffee in the morning, tea in the afternoon. <laughs> bagels and poutine definitely not poutine like that is so really <laughs> oh my god they even serve it at our cafeteria right it's the um, see like poutine is probably like the peak of unhealthiness but it is I, so like good. absolutely not <laughs> but it's so good <laughs> well and the other thing i've tried to become a little more gluten-free so it's hard to have montreal bagels and you know the bagels that are pretending to be bagels without wheat they don't taste very good so okay. gluten-free <laughs> is no fun i see are you I think as far as open and acquired data, ex yeah, the extrovert, introvert, I'm a little, I'm in a bit of both, you know, there's a bit mm -hmm. of both. It's interesting. I don't think it's always, I guess I'm more extroverted than yeah. introverted, but there's a sort of introversion aspect of my life as well. Uh, and so it's a little bit of both. My dad was more sort of introverted. My mother, mother was very extroverted. So I've got a little bit of genetic material from both yeah. of them. <laughs> Environment um, factors, yeah. But anyway, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk a little bit about you know, we're, where we're at here. And I'm just so, I feel so excited that we may actually have some disease modifying therapies that can make a, therapies that could make a difference. But it's going to be complicated because most people with Alzheimer's disease have more than just Alzheimer's disease. And yeah. the vasculature has been under under um, valued as a contributing factor. In fact, Alzheimer's disease is a disease of the blood vessels as well as of the brain itself. Mm -hmm. And it can cause fatal hemorrhage by itself hopefully we can eat, advance both you know like alzheimer's disease as a brain issue but also like study more of the vasculature so we can understand it better and hopefully there's going to be more also communication in between those two fields right very hopeful that with conferences and things like that people are going to get interested in well it. no they're they are starting to get interested in the in the u.s which sort of dominates yeah they call it vascular contributions to dementia the Europeans were often more balanced. And, you know, I was thought for the longest time that the commonest cause of dementia was vascular. Frankly, it's, it's almost, you know, theoretical because Alzheimer's disease, yes, but it's affecting the vessels. Yeah. So I, I think the vessel, you need, you need a whole family of cells. This is one of my preaching points when I give talks, lay talks. And that is the unit of the brain, because I was interested in what are the units of the brain, right? It's basically, the endothelial, the actual little capillary blood vessel with the endothelial cells. There's little protective cells around, the, around those called pericytes, which are guard cells. So the astrocytes, which are part of the blood-brain barrier, so it keeps out toxic, uh, toxic uh, substances. And then there are the neurons themselves, but they're only part of a big family. Without, they've got a big family looking after them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a family of cells. All of them have to be healthy. And everybody just focuses on the neurons. Yeah. And not what's feeding the neurons, what's making them allow to be, you know, active, right? And so I always show this picture of the family of cells. And it's sort of a it's a it's a paradigm of the human being too, right? We need families. We need family support. Everybody has a different role. And without that, it's very hard to, you know, develop normally, right? 
Yeah, I think what you were advocating for is like a much more holistic view of Alzheimer's disease. I know you have to go soon yes. and I don't want to hold you, yes. but I just want to thank you again. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me here. And this has been very, very interesting and I've learned a lot. And hopefully, thank you very, thank you very much, Barry. I, I really appreciate it. And of course, I had a wonderful visit to Quebec at the Cuban, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, just loved it. I mean, there's so such terrific work going on in brain imaging in Quebec. They're really leaders. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, I really appreciated that opportunity. And thank you very much for yeah. listening, hearing me out. Okay. <laughs> thank, you. So thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye.